The mystery of where do we come from and where do we go has always fascinated thinking men. As human control over the forces of nature grew, and man became increasingly conscious of his latent powers, he began to speculate about his own capacity to equal and even to oppose the laws of creation. There was no great conceptual leap from the Prometheus legend in which man, arrogant in his purposeful knowledge, tried to wrest the elemental secret of fire from the gods, to the mechanical man, the ingenious Melzo, made in the early 19th century, or to the mechanical heart invented by Carroll and Lindbergh in our day. Like all peoples, Jews, too, were intrigued by the idea of creation. Alien to all tenets of rationalistic Judaism, even sacrilegious in opposing itself to God, Jewish folklore nevertheless boasts a number of legends in which man superseded God as creator. An astonishing piece of impudence from the pious, but breathtaking in its sheer daring. The Golem, or homunculus legend in Jewish folklore, is very ancient, dating back to rabbinic times. In its literal meaning, the word golem means lifeless, shapeless matter, into which the one who has discovered the tetragrammaton, or God's ineffable name, can, by its mystic means, breathe the impulse of life. There is little doubt that the Talmudic speculations about the creation of the first man stimulated the growth of the golem legends. There is the following passage in the Talmud, complete with all implied directives that were avidly taken up by the legendary golem creators. How was Adam created? In the first hour his dust was collected. In the second his form was created. In the third he became a shapeless mass. In the fourth his members were joined. In the fifth his apertures opened. In the sixth he received his soul. In the seventh he stood up on his feet. According to the Agada, in the Talmud, the celebrated Rabbi Rabba had created a homunculus. This creature was a man like any other man, except that he lacked the power of speech which God alone could endow. When in a mood of egoism and vainglory, Rabba sent his golem to Rabbi Zera, that sage quickly discovered the creature's magical origin and indignantly returned him to the dust from which he was fashioned. The creation of man was God's own business, he said. There is also the legend in the Talmud about the two rabbis, Hanina and Oshaga. Every Friday, by means of mystic formulae from the Book of Creation, they would make a three-year-old calf, which they ate on the Sabbath. The 11th century Bible exegesist, Rashi, became thoroughly saturated with Jewish Kabbalah and with supernaturalism of the medieval Christian world, even tried to give the account a dubious religious sanction. They, Hanina and Oshaga, used to combine the letters of the name by which the universe was created. This is not to be considered forbidden magic, for the words of God were brought into being through his holy name. Jewish legend even has Rashi's great contemporary, the poet-philosopher of Valencia, Solomon ibn Gibiro, create a maidservant golem. When the king heard of it, he wished to put the Jewish poet to death for practicing black magic, but Gabiro demonstrated to the king's royal satisfaction that the creature he made was not human, and forthwith he returned her to dust. Another golem was alleged to have been created in the time of the Crusades in France by Rabbi Samuel, the father of the famous Judah Hasid. He fashioned a homunculus, but, like Rabba in biblical times, he could not make it talk. Wherever he went, this golem accompanied him as his servant and vigilant bodyguard. Christian Europe, too, had its own versions of the homunculus. What else are the medieval legends of Dr. Faustus and the poet Virgil? Even as Rashi believed in the authenticity of the creation of the rabbinical calf, so did the most advanced Christian thinkers of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance believe in the legend of Virgil's statue, into which the poet had breathed life and forced it to obey his will in various escapades. By the time of the late Renaissance, legends about golems were widespread among the Jews of Eastern Europe. The most popular folktale was that of the Golem of Chelm, created by the redoubtable Kabbalist Rabbi Elijah of that town. He allegedly created it during the middle of the 16th century by means of God's ineffable name. This mystical name he wrote on a piece of parchment and placed it in the earthen golem's forehead. Little did he dream what a monster the creature would turn out to be. When he beheld its frightful aspect, 
and its destructive tendencies, he began to repent his folly in making it. His golem could very well destroy the whole world. So he drew forth the ineffable name from its forehead, and immediately the monster turned to dust. It would be interesting to investigate what Mary Shelley knew of this legend when she wrote her Frankenstein Schiller. In 1625, the eminent Italian Jewish doctor, scientist, and encyclopedic scholar Joseph del Medigo, while journeying through Germany, Poland, and Lithuania, observed that many golem legends of this sort are current, particularly in Germany. The legend of the golem of Helm was undoubtedly one of those he heard. The golem of Prague, the most popular of all the Jewish golem stories, is without doubt merely a later-day variation of the older tales. How it happened to fix on the historical personality of Rabbi Yehuda Lo will always remain a fruitful source of speculation for the folklorist and the historian of Jewish culture. It is sufficient that it has been, and still is, one of the most alive as well as one of the liveliest among all Jewish folk legends. This fact is not without its historical or national cultural interest. The image of the golem, as it was already fully developed in the 16th century golem of Helm, was that of a Frankenstein with frightful propensities for tearing up and smiting down. It remained for the later legend of the golem of Prague to endow the terrifying figure with moral and social grandeur. The crude, shapeless lump of clay no longer was a figure symbolic of the genius of indiscriminate destruction. The golem in the hands of the Maharal of Prague became a national protector of the persecuted Jews, a godsent avenger of the wrongs done to a helpless people. It is precisely this aspect of the folk imagination and the historical forces that stimulated it that are of the most universal interest. For as is well known, folk legends are not just accidental in their origin or fanciful fictions invented by the childlike masses. They are a true record and mirror of the complicated historical and cultural experiences of a people. The middle of the 17th century was a cataclysmic period for the Jewish people of Europe. It marked the most dreadful massacre of Jews in history, of course, excepting those by the Nazis in World War II. The terrible ravages of the Thirty Years' War and the revolt of the Cossacks against Polish rule left the Jews of Europe frightfully decimated and shattered. This was immediately followed by the messianic fevers which tortured and racked the spirits of those Jews who survived the bloody Holocaust, and finally left them spent and disenchanted. Darkness and superstition descended on the Jewish ghetto as it never had before. Nowhere could Jews themselves cope with the problems of their survival. God, it seemed to them, had abandoned them to the sword and the persecution of the enemy without, and to the seduction and betrayal of the messianic swindlers within such as the Messiah of Smyrna, Sabbatai Zevi. So, in its despair, the folk mind, fed by the sickly Kabbalistic dreams and myths current at the time, created the magical figure of the golem to protect the Jew's puny weakness with his enormous physical strength, to discover by means of his supernatural powers the plotters against their peace and thus foil their wicked plans. It was the golem as redeemer that, viewed within the historical frame of reference of the tormented Jewish life in the 17th century in Europe, lends the legend such haunting poignancy.